please take your time with your words. Um, it takes longer to say the same things in Spanish. So just please don't rush through your words. And if you're having any issues with the interpretation, feel free to send me a message via the chat and I'll be happy to help that way. I'm going to repeat this in Spanish now. Eh, hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Yasmin. Estoy aquí de parte de la cooperativa de lenguaje comunitaria para facilitar un espacio de justicia de lenguaje. Eh, queremos que todos puedan participar en el idioma de su corazón, así que vamos a activar la función de interpretación simultánea. Como pueden ver en este momento en la parte inferior de su pantalla, pueden ver un globo que dice interpretación. Ahí pueden hacer clic para seleccionar su idioma preferido si no son completamente bilingües en inglés y en español. También les pido que tengan en mente su velocidad y su claridad porque el español es más largo que el inglés, así que tarda más tiempo decir lo mismo. Entonces, si están teniendo también algún problema con la interpretación, siéntanse libres de enviarme un mensaje por el chat, pero ya sería todo. Por favor, elijan ese idioma. Ok, I'll thank you so much. Uh, please remember to select that preferred language and I think we are good to go. Great, thank you so very much, Jasmine. And um, I'll go ahead and uh, kick it on over to Angelique Espinoza. Thank you, Jordan. I'm Angelique Espinoza. I'm the policy director for Good Business Colorado. And I wanna welcome all of our attendees. We have quite a few participants on the line today, which is very exciting. I would also like to thank our guests who are here with us today, uh, Rachel West, with Senator Bennett's office, and John Conrad and Naveed Parmar with Senator Hickenlooper's office. Naveen, have I said your name correctly? Yeah, thanks, Naveen. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanna thank Jasmine again for being here and helping to make this, this webinar available uh, to a broader range of folks. Okay, I would also like to um, really appreciate our partners who broadcast out this opportunity far and wide. And um, Jordan, I bet you have the list right off the top of your head. Would you thank our partners properly? Yeah, I absolutely would. And I apologize uh, for skipping over that part. Yeah, uh, you know, it's because of the, the partner organizations that we're able to work with um, to really help get this information out that we're able to, to host events like this. And so, uh, thank you so very much to Adelante Community Development, the Alliance Center, um, the B Black Business Initiative, Business for America, Colorado Black Chamber of Commerce, Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce, Environmental Entrepreneurs, or E2, um, the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Boulder County, uh, Local First out in Durango, Metro Deep, uh, Partnership for Community Action, Rocky Mountain Microfinance Institute, Small Business Majority, and Work-Life Partnership. Uh, these are all really fantastic organizations and I uh, just really appreciate the opportunity um, to work with everyone, so thank you. Thanks very much, Jordan. And thanks to all of those partner organizations. Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started. Uh, just as some big picture context, um, we've had, we have, are working on two big infrastructure bills, one of which just passed. That's the bipartisan infrastructure bill that contains more traditional roads and bridges types of projects in it. And then we have the second infrastructure bill, if you will, the Build Back Better bill, which contains really the, the social safety net and the climate action components of the Biden administration's uh, domestic agenda. Now that bill is not bipartisan. That's gonna take all the Democrats and all of the independents to pass, as I understand it. Uh, and so a lot of negotiations have been going on to try and reach the place where everyone um, who needs to vote for the bill in the House and the Senate can get on board. So um, there are many components in the plan. This, of course, is specifically a business um, webinar on those issues. So I'm just going to ask Rachel and then John and Naveen to lay out for us what they feel are the salient points for businesses um, that their senator's office wants to ensure that gets highlighted. So we'll start with Rachel. Sure. Thanks, Angelique. Um, 
Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I know I've met with uh, many folks who are, who are participating before. Um, I'm Rachel, I handle uh, economic policy and, and tax, you know, minus energy credits and trade uh, for Michael Bennett. Um, and so I know, you know, we wanna focus on the, the Build Back Better package today, but just wanted to take a, a minute as Angelique said and, and highlight a couple of things from, from the infrastructure package that as she said, uh, just uh, passed Congress and is now, you know, ready for the president to sign. Um, so the first of these two, uh, you know, big packages, um, they, and the two really go hand in hand, but both benefit uh, small businesses uh, directly and indirectly in, in some really deliberate ways. So the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that um, that is uh, ready to become law already, uh, you know, it, it is estimated to create millions of, of jobs, high quality, well-paying jobs, and, and a lot of contracting opportunities for small businesses, uh, and, and really intended to improve, you know, the, the aging and outdated infrastructure that we know is really holding back our economy and our businesses and our workers, um, which should be a real, you know, boost all around to uh, what has been flagging productivity and, um, you know, lagging efficiencies in our economy. So as Angelique said, it's not, it's, it's not just roads, bridges, um, and, and ports, um, it's also, you know, hard infrastructure sort of broadly defined. So that includes, for example, a big broadband initiative that uh, is based on a bill that my boss put forward, the, the Bridge Act. And that means, you know, Colorado will have a, a minimum investment of $100 million to help reach uh, rural areas to help uh, reach low income families um, and 1.3 million Coloradans uh, will benefit from um, from this these additional supports for broadband and that's really coming at a time when um, you know with with businesses struggling to find workers and remote work really still in full swing in a lot of areas and hybrid in others. Uh, we think that is really going to go a long way toward um, helping uh, people get back to work, helping businesses find workers. Um, so I think Naveen and John will be able to talk more about some of the, the clean energy provisions and other parts of that um, bipartisan infrastructure package, but just wanted to highlight that, you know, there's already uh, a lot that has gone on in the past several weeks uh, in Congress to get us uh, toward uh, what the president has laid out um, in his agenda. The second part of that, as Angelique mentioned, is, is this Build Back Better Act, which is the, the human infrastructure and the climate provisions. Right now, the framework uh, that ha has been outlined is, is uh, about a, a 1.75 trillion dollars, uh, so significantly smaller than the originally proposed package, uh, but nonetheless, uh, just historic set of investments in human infrastructure and climate. Uh, the progress that we have made so far after uh, months of, of very public negotiations on the Democratic side about that. Uh, you know, we do now have a final framework from, from the White House. The House of Representatives um, has produced its rule committee print. They plan to pass the bill on November 15th once the Congressional Budget Office has had a chance to weigh in on the score. Um, so we in the Senate are on a little bit of a lagged timeline relative to where we expect it to be, but we are, my expectation and Naveen and John should say if they expect otherwise is that the poor parliamentarian will work over the week of Thanksgiving very hard to review all of the provisions, get it ready for the Senate, and then we will be able to, to pass something we hope shortly after Thanksgiving that looks very similar to what is in the house, but, but not exactly the same. Um, so I'll let Naveen and John say more about their boss's work on, on the Small Business Committee specifically, but my boss, Michael, is on the Finance Committee and so just wanted to highlight a few things that are really important for small businesses and workers uh, as part of the work that that committee has been doing. Uh, you know, as, as this audience knows, better than anybody else, um, you know, workers, managers, business owners are also their parents, their caregivers. And so one really important thing that this bill does um, in finances jurisdiction and in other committees jurisdictions is to make these historic investments that mean that, that workers uh, will be able to, to better manage their responsibilities at work and at home. And we hope that that will address some of these issues of, you know, workers on the sideline who due to COVID and caregiving responsibility really uh, can't fully rejoin the workforce um, in the way that they want to at this point. 
Um, so that those investments include, you know, historic investments in affordable child care, universal pre-K, home care, uh, paid family leave, all of which will help workers stay, get in and stay in the workforce. And then, you know, a particular priority for my boss, for example, that he's been working on for years is extending this expanded child tax credit from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, you know, that uh, not only cuts child poverty nearly in half this year and will next year if we're able to extend it, uh, but it's also, you know, giving a huge economic boost to local economies as families go out and, you know, spend those monthly payments on necessities uh, at local businesses. And then secondly, another part of the, the work that he has done um, is uh, the expanded earned income tax credit in a bill that, that he put forward for years with Sherrod Brown um, that will boost the EITC for, for low-income workers without children and expand it to lower, uh, younger workers and older workers and help bring back some of those folks into the workforce by sort of making work pay a little bit more um, for, for those low-paid workers. Um, and then, then finally, I think, you know, it wouldn't, would be remiss in a Colorado event if we didn't mention a couple of things that include a workforce housing, uh, a subject that, you know, both my boss and Senator Hickenlooper are very passionate about finding solutions to. We know businesses in Colorado are struggling to find workers because workers can't afford to live in the communities that they're based in. And so this bill makes uh, historic investments in, in housing and also boosts the low-income housing tax credit to make sure we can increase supply for low and low-income workers, housing that they can afford. And then, uh, you know, a second thing that I, uh, my colleague Suzanne handles, but just want to highlight is huge investments in climate, $555 billion, the biggest investment in our history in mitigating, preventing climate uh, change uh, from, from um, uh, you know, further worsening. So this bill creates new and expands existing you know, green energy and clean energy credits, energy efficient taxi tax credits. Um, and, um, and will help us um, prevent and, and mitigate the damage from, from natural disasters. Uh, finally, I, I'm happy to talk more in, in Q&A about some of the revenue raisers, but I would say a key thing that we are looking for in, in uh, our search for you know, how, how to pay for this package uh, has been not only making our tax code fairer and more equitable and more just, but also leveling the playing field between a lot of small businesses that are paying their fair share in taxes and you know, large corporations, multinational corporations that are have ways uh, that they can easily uh, avoid a tax bill. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Naveen and to John to talk about some of the, the small business committee work that their boss is doing. Thanks, Rachel. Hopefully folks can hear me okay. Um, I, I wanna start with um, some of the things you left that you started with, Rachel, with on the um, bipartisan infrastructure package um, prior to um, my time with the senator, I spent two years as the general counsel for the Committee on Small Business, and we did a lot of work on trying to get um, an infrastructure package passed. We, we talked to a lot of small businesses. We talked to retailers and restaurants and hoteliers and, and truckers and everybody across the board on how um, they, for years and years, had wanted to get a infrastructure package done um, because it would benefit small businesses in the economy at writ large. And, and you know, as, a, as Rachel mentioned, as of last weekend, um, you know, that bill got across the finish line. And we think there's some really good things in there, both obviously for Colorado in terms of, um, you know, $3.7 billion for roads and $225 billion for bridge replacement and repairs. And, um, $100 million uh, to expand internet access. And we know how, that, how important that is for um, small businesses. Yeah. You, you've gotten, there you go. <laughs> Keep I that got to do this it. thing. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'll do this thing um, uh, for, for, for broadband. And I think that, you know, all of those things like that I mentioned, you know, that in terms of like building our infrastructure and supporting our infrastructure, having a resilient infrastructure and um, all the money for, Public transit—it's the it's largest investment in public transit that that we'll have seen in, in our nation's history. Those kind of things that we think will benefit small businesses. Um, it'll make make it easier for those businesses to receive goods and transport goods. And one of those things along those lines that my boss um, definitely led on was expanding the amount um, expand to boost clean energy and 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 have more um, clean 
the re was the recharge act, which would just basically allow for more um, clean energy cars to you know electrical vehicles to recharge as as they're moving around the country, and it promotes affordable and um, equitable EV charging, and also reduces costs for um, for, for electrical vehicles just to you know, to be able to transport again goods and services. So we're really part of that that recharge act, and it does a couple of things again supports the clean energy clean energy economy some good paying jobs and also um you know will 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 mitigate the, the impacts of climate change so i did want to as rachel mentioned start with the the infrastructure package that we just passed did one also mentioned it's fully paid for um won't be raising any taxes on on small businesses at all um so we think we're really proud of that effect as well um on the build back but moving to the build back better i um, really excited about some of the things in the small business space. The, um, one of the big things that the boss has always talked about as a, as a former small business owner um, is access to capital. You know, that, again, I mentioned I spent a couple of years with the Committee on Small Business um, on the House side. We talked about um, sort of two sort of general concepts or the boss thinks about supporting small businesses um, from the federal perspective in, in two sort of frameworks, which is um, access to capital and access to customers, right? Like if you, you, you need, sort of need both of those to, to make things work. Um, you can have a great idea. And he went through a number of banks and um, lending institutions before he started WinCoop and they, he was turned down by all of them. And he eventually ended up getting an SBA loan <clears throat> to help support his business as well. So I think that um, there's things in, in the Build Back Better agenda uh, and that, that, we, that we have a little bit of a, hand, a footprint in. We have a of an access to capital bill, um, what's called the it's the micro S, it's a micro SBIC program, which is a joint is a public pri private partnership between um, venture capital and investment investment managers who are then able to access some some seed money from the from uh, from SBA to make loans to um, small businesses. We th it's a great program. We think that program, however, like many government programs, can be improved. Um, we think that the investment managers involved in that program are often, um, you know, look a certain way, act a certain way, and and come from a certain demographic. So we, our bill would create an emerging managers fund, which would allow diverse managers, um, women and minority owned business, women and minorities, to access potentially access the fund. And then we've seen correlative studies <clears throat> with respect to if you have diverse asset managers that they are making those investments in. Um, you know, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, and rural-owned businesses. We wrote that into the bill that you know, we didn't want to think of underserved as just um, you know some an urban issue. There are underserved businesses in in rural America too, so we wrote that into the bill as well. Um, one of the other things that we um, we have likely that will likely be part of the bill is um, support for um, our Native American affairs part uh, community. Um, we know that um, there's a lot of Economic economic issues and on 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 the native and tribal lands. So we supporting five million dollars a year for this SBA's Office of Native American Affairs. And what that what that provisional what that program will do is get contracting and counseling and access to and, and lending opportunities out to the Native American community as well. And the third the third provision we think should be part of that package is um is is a is a bill we've called the Capital for Cooperatives. We know cooperatives are a are, you know, Colorado is sort of the capital of cooperatives. There's many of them in the farming community, in the um, in the healthcare space, and they are prohibited right now because of the current lending SBA uh, lending structures to access the 7A lending program. Cooperatives are, and we think that if we made that we gave them made a little technical change, created a little bit of funding, um, seed funding for them that we could promote cooperatives as well um, across the board. So those are three bills that we're working on um, through our through the Small Business Committee. Um, we're, we're also supportive of other measures to, again, increase capital to small businesses and increase the opportunities for small businesses and increase customers as well. And I'm, so I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about um, just some, some of the other sort of big picture items that are involved in that pack, involved that might be rolling throughout, rolling out from the Small Business Committee as well. Yeah, thanks, I mean, So um, as part of our boss's role on the Small Business Committee, he's negotiated um, or being, you know, been part of the nego negotiations for about $5 billion um, in spending that'll run through the Build Back Better package. Um, and I'll give you guys some numbers of what we're thinking right now. Obviously, this is subject to change, but 
we do think it is uh, pretty well baked at this point. So in terms of contracting, we'll have about 1.6 billion for the Minority Business Development Agency. About a billion is provided to support so for broad business center programs, another 400 million to establish um, regional offices and perform research and uh, 200 million for rural business centers. Um, there's also another 200 million for to expand the uh, Growth Accelerator Fund competition, which provides competitive grants nationally to organizations um, looking to support small businesses. Um, there's also a billion dollars for what the administration calls uplift incubators. So these are different programs at various um, minority serving institutions, HBCUs, um, and other places that are meant to help um, small disadvantaged businesses. Um, and then another big program that we're really excited about is the access um, on the access to capital note, which is something you know, our boss feels is very important. Um, is there's $2 billion to establish an SBA direct lend lending product. So as I'm sure most of you know, um, right now you can't just borrow right from the SBA, you have to go through intermediaries. And so we think that this offers a great opportunity to get um, you know, money into the hand of, hands of individuals that need it. Um, and there's also, along with the $10 million going to um, the uh, Office of um, Native American Affairs, there's also another $10 million going to the Office of Rural Affairs and an Office of Emerging Markets. That's to help uh, rural small businesses and small businesses looking to export as well. Um, uh, the 7A Community Advantage Program, which some of you might be familiar with, and I'm happy to expand on. It's going to get another um, $275 million. Um, there's about $100 million for ent entrepreneurial training initiatives for the formerly incarcerated. Um, and uh, there's also going to be $35 million for um, veterans federal procurement entrepreneurship training. So basically, um, helping veteran-owned businesses work through um, the, uh, uh, the federal contracting space and getting, helping them um, you know, make sure they're the front lines and getting looked at um, first. And uh, I think that's kind of the highlights, um, but happy to, uh, to talk through some of these programs with you guys as well. If I can just add one thing to what John said, or, or, or he, did, he did a great job sort of outlining those, those programs in the, in that, that we're thinking of um, in, the, in the small business committee space. Um, the one I would want to want to put a finer point on is that um, the, the two billion dollars he mentioned for the small business direct lending program, that is a real um, sea change in how the SBA operates operates. You know, as, as some of you may know, John mentioned, you know, that we, most small businesses operate through intermediaries and go to go to banks, but um, we think that's a that's great for some small businesses, and you know the small business the the sort of SBA has always I think thought of been thought of as a lender of of last resort. You know you go to your credit union and you go to your CDFI and then you start looking at your credit card, and then then you go to the SBA. You have to like meet that credit elsewhere test that is very very hard to meet, and then you you do that and then you can maybe get a loan from the SBA. We think for a certain percentage of small businesses for a certain cohort, the ones that are having trouble, that get high interest rates, that don't want to access to their credit card, that, you know, maybe the SBA could be the, the very first place that they go to get a direct loan, to get a guarantee, to get something, to get a low interest loan to, to start a business. Um, and we think that that's going to be really important for um, just economic development in Colorado and across the country in general, especially <clears throat> given that, um, you know, that there's, that, that, that small businesses in general have been, you know, as you guys are living and breathing it, fighting it every day, uh, you know, just just trying to stay stay above water um, during the pandemic. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the, the question and answer queue. I doubt we're going to get through them all, but perhaps we can just save whatever questions don't get answered today and send them along and, and perhaps you all can provide some answers or point people in the right direction. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to follow on what you were just speaking about, um, um, uh, Naveen, around the small business, the SBA programs. So we have a question, um, kind of a few questions in one from the same person uh, regarding the small business supports. Um, are, are these um, funding for new programs or existing programs? And what other type of small business opportunities do you expect specifically? 
and related to that, how much of that um, the package will come to Denver, Colorado? And I believe right now it's standing at around 1.5 trillion for the overall Build Back Better. Um, so I think that some of these uh, in that are the the uh, the SBA lending program. Some of them are. Um, additions to existing programs, like the, like the Community Advantage program was a pilot program at the SBA. It, they, it's been in effect for three or four years. It's, I don't think it's ever been funded nearly um, to, the, to the tune of $600 million. So that's like you know, a, a program that's, that exists at the SBA and they wanna make, and they, and they want to expand it a little bit. There's another program um, you know, the, the, in terms of like incubators. Sorry. Naveen, can you? <laughs> yeah, got it. Incubators and um, you know some of the contracting contracting provisions again have always existed at the at the SBA, and they see some success there, so they want to expand those as well. So it's a combination of expanding and creating some new programs. The new again, the new program that I would mention <clears throat> on on in general that that, that we're supportive of is the um, access to capital program, the direct lending program. That's something that's new. That you, they used to do that. New, okay, new being relative, right? Um, so they used to do this back in up until 1994. We the the SBA used to do direct lending, um, and then for budgetary reasons, um, President Clinton slashed it. So. It's, uh, I guess that, that would be, I guess we can view that as a reincarnation of an old program. Um, so there, there's that particular provision. And then the, in terms of new, um, our, our um, what we're calling our micro SBIC bill or micro small business investing bill, that's a new, that's a new subset of the overall program. Their overall program is the SBIC program, um, small business investment company program. And then, you know, this emerging, um, emerging investor program is, is, is new and a subset of that because we think it could be, we think it can improve and, and meet a different demographic. Um, and yeah, I think the number is, is still a little bit TBD, but I think the general rule from what I'm in my nine months with, with, with the Senator is that um, I think it's about, and Rachel can check me here. I think it's Colorado gets about 2% of uh, federal dollars somewhere along those lines. So Whatever the final number sort of lands at, um, take that number, and I'm the worst at math. And multiply it by two percent, and that's probably a rough guesstimate of how much Colorado should get uh, based on population. Great. Um, I want to ask about childcare. We've had a few questions um, around this issue, so um, one of our very first questions is. Noting that childcare access and affordability are essential for businesses and for the community economic health, retains a strong workforce, supports women's workforce participation, and allows greater economic productivity. Um, and then noted some, some numbers actually in terms of the lost productivity and wages because we are in such a crisis of childcare here in Colorado. And if you can even find care, it's um, you know $20,000 a year or more for an infant, um, which is quite a bit. Um, so there was another question regarding childcare that specifically also pertained to um, the local, small local sort of co-op type of child care. And I'm just scrolling to see if I can find that one because it was a nice specific question. Um, oh, here's another one too. Why does the Child Care Entitlement Act and Universal Preschool not include recommendations that owners be compensated for their work in their business? usually referenced as profit rather than designated as a salary. Without it, we fear that private childcare may become obsolete. And then finally, um, specifically in terms of Colorado implementing preschool for all, will the Build Back Better infusion dollars support smaller local private childcare providers who are typically women? Sure, I, I can uh, take a first crack here at describing some of the provisions with the caveat that uh, I am not our uh, child care expert. Senate uh, offices are pretty large, so I have a colleague um, who is sort of full time on, on education and, and um, 
and uh, early childhood issues. Um, so uh, you know, you can blame me if you get misinformation from me, tell Donnie. Um, but so I, I'll have to get back on this on the very specific question about you know owners being um, being compensated. Uh, that's one that I'll you know need to take a note on and get back to you because I don't want to say I don't want to misspeak there on on how that would work, um, but want to take that that concern very seriously on uh, on the details in general. Uh, you know what this bill uh, does is. Um, it, it, it would basically um, create a system such that, uh, you know, a family of four that's making under about $300,000 a year would, would pay for childcare only on a sliding scale with relation to their income. And that amount that they pay would be capped at a maximum of 7% of, of income. So to that example of, you know, it costs $20,000 in parts of Colorado to put an infant in childcare, you know, that would be... Uh, both um, uh, taken on a sliding scale with the family's income, so reduced for low and, and middle income families, and capped for most families, so it would really make childcare significantly more affordable. And that's for, for families who are already working, you know, in recognition of the fact that what's keeping many families from getting into the workforce, particularly women um, who, who may, uh, you know, not have a, a co-parent in the home is that they don't already have childcare. So in recognition of that, you know, for families making up to two and a half percent of, of median income in the state, um, well, a family is, uh, a parent is looking for work or in an education or training program that's going to get them into uh, a better job, um, they would also be subject to that, that sliding scale for, for income-based payment and capped at, at 7%. So should really help address some of the, the severe you know, problems we see uh, employers are seeing in, in you know, not having the, the, the volume of workers coming in the door or being able to keep those workers. Um, so it, it, it really does mean that that you know nine out of ten families with young kids would be would be covered under this bill just because of the the um, because of how how far and how how low it goes you know up and down the income scale, the money uh, would go to states. Um, so it would uh, largely come to to Colorado through um, an increase in the allotment of their child care and development uh, block grant. Um, and they, states are required to use that money, you know, not only to subsidize child care for, for families by, by reimbursing them for, um, for what they spend, but also uh, to increase the supply of high quality child care. Um, so they are required to use a quarter of the funds that they receive to increase supply and, and build quality. Um, in addition to that, um, to providing those subsidies and to, to standing up the infrastructure to do this on a wide scale. And you know, after 2025, there uh, it puts in place um, a, a you know, federal state cost sharing structure that is um, somewhat similar to Medicaid where um, the, the federal government would, would cover 90% of the cost and, and co state's costs would, would sort of phase in. Um, and it also, you know, on the side expands existing um, programs and capabilities that states have, including, you know, Head Start and, and grants to, to low-income families um, seeking child care. Uh, so uh, really robust and really important, I think, part of the, the Build Back Better Act. Um, and uh, happy to, you know, follow up on some of ver the very specific questions that are, that are asked in the chat. Naveen and, and John, you should feel free to chime in too. Or if, if you feel like it's covered, we can move on to another question. Okay. Um, so uh, related uh, uh, in terms of sort of social safety net, we have some questions around healthcare and around paid family leave. So in terms of healthcare, um, you know, it's very difficult for small businesses to compete with larger businesses that can afford to provide health care benefits for their employees. Um, we just passed here in the state the Colorado option, uh, which, uh, which includes small group plans. Um, but is there anything in the Build Back Better plan that it will help small businesses be able to 
provide health care or, or that even will help them to, to get health care entrepreneurs for them for themselves as well as their employees. And I'll let Naveen and, and uh, John speak to that if they can from their, their bosses sits on the health, health committee. I unfortunately um, am not qualified to speak to the health care provisions. And Naveen, you're oh, muted. Naveen, you're, you're muted, yeah. Oh, you're muted. Yep, got it. Um, and I and I apologize that I, I don't handle that. Sort of, we have a, a dedicated staff referred to the, the healthcare um, and, and and education pieces of, of the portfolio as well. And I'm happy to circle back with with folks. But I know there are, um, you know, through the there are tax credits and, and coverage options for in build in build back better to help folks. Um, specifically through the end of 25, you know, adults in the in the coverage gap, there is gaps for folks that are, were able to have an advanced premium tax credit and cost sharing reductions for, um, you know, to, to be able to access um, healthcare plans and, and Affordable Care Act plans as well. And then there's also things along things that I think will help individuals um, in, in terms of you know improvements to um, the affordability of, of health insurance in the marketplaces as well, allowing small business, small businesses, some reduced reductions in, in, in tax credits in, um, in the bill back better that will give families, maybe not, you know, in the, sh maybe not in the shop exchange, but give, you know, co give workers their ability to access healthcare. And then there's some things that are happening on the prescription drugs, drug space. Um, again, these are all sort of in the individual space that will allow, um, prescription drug pricing reform as well, but I could, we can circle back with you on some of those more specific things um, in the in 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 Build Back Better on the on the healthcare front. Yeah, and and just to say on paid leave, you know, I um, I I regret to say I think that's uh, you know it's still up in the air what the Senate will do. I think it's no secret that uh, Senator Manchin. Um, a little bit on an island in um, in his thinking on on paid leave in the in the caucus and uh, has not been supportive to date um, of uh, you know implementing even a, in a fairly modest uh, paid leave program or compared to what the administration um, had had initially proposed and compared to what the House Ways and Means Committee uh, had put together back in, in September, you know, 12 weeks of, of uh, very broad based paid family leave that for a state like Colorado uh, that will be um, standing up uh, its own program and its own very robust program would help take away some of that, the cost burden um, uh, of, of doing that uh, while still um, enabling uh, Colorado to, to you know, distribute really robust benefits to, to its working families. Uh, so we were extremely excited about that and, and um, you know, did, <sighs> disappointed to see uh, how that provision has been cut down, you know, not only in the step down from the initial $3.5 trillion bill uh, to this $1.75 trillion, uh, but also, you know, due to some, some particular members' um, hesitations. Right now, the House has a, a provision that would provide four weeks of uh, paid family medical leave. Um, but, you know, it remains to be seen uh, what happens um, when when that's passed on the 15th and, and comes over to the Senate. There may be some problems with um, with you know Senate rules, the bird rule uh, with uh, with that program. But on the whole, you know, the the major hurdle that we face is that some members are not uh, convinced that that needs to be in the package. So I think, uh, you know, from the finance committee perspective, we're very hopeful, uh, but um, but very uncertain that that will uh, stay stay in the package at this point. But uh, just like childcare it is tremendously important uh, as a way to get families into the, the workforce and to keep them there um, and to take some burden off of businesses that we know want to provide um, robust um, options for their workers, uh, but but aren't able to do so without some, some help and security. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to read a couple of comments for y'all to take back to your bosses. 
Um, thank you. I think you've kind of given us a good as, as much answer as you can. Um, but one of uh, the folks on the call just wants us to remember that reimbursements for healthcare require families to have upfront money and wait to get it back. And you know, as we know, some very large percentage of Coloradans don't have even $400 for any kind of an emergency, whether it's a health emergency or a car emergency. Um, so, you know, if, if that's something that I think really needs to be, well, that this person says needs to be rethought. Um, additionally, we have a greeting card sending service, um, woman-owned small business on the line. Uh, and it, she it just wants to reiterate that paid leave helps businesses like hers retain employees while freeing up payroll for substitute coverage until the employee returns. And we know that retention is higher from states that have public paid leave. So that, that's something that, um, of course, you know, Good Business Colorado was in the forefront of passing that bill in Colorado. It's like, hugely important to our members. Um, and we would just, we really want to support uh, trying to keep that in the package and, um, you know, leaning on whoever you got to lean on to make it work. Yeah, and I would I would just say uh, you know greatly appreciative to all of those comments. We'll take them back to our bosses when we talk to the finance committee uh, staff. Um, you know, months ago now about how what they're planning would interact with Colorado's uh, paid leave program. You know, they they are thinking of that program um, as a which according to the Department of Labor is, is on track uh, in terms of timing, they are thinking of that as one of the most robust efforts in the, in the country and a model program. Uh, so A, congratulations to Colorado, that's off. Uh, but B, you know, that is, that's really what they are shooting for um, in, in building the framework for a national policy. So that's great to hear. I'm gonna move to climate. Um, we've got a lot of other questions that pertain to the to the to some of the things that we've talked about, but I wanna make sure that we get to the climate issues, which are also so incredibly important uh, to our, our membership. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question from uh, Susan Nadell from E2, if I can find it. Scrolling. There we go. Could you talk about the domestic content requirements in Build Back Better? Will it take time for US, it will take time rather, for US manufacturing to ramp up and become competitive? How does the domestic content equitably manage that transition and not slow down our transition to renewable energy? And Naveen, John, are you guys equipped to, to speak to the climate provisions? Oh, you're on mute. You. That's one we may have to take back to our team in terms, it seems a very, very specific question. I think the one yeah. thing we can, we can say is that, um, you know, the infrastructure package, you know, did have a lot of climate provisions in it. And, you know, we're, we're supportive of those. I mentioned the Recharge Act. And then you know the climate provisions in the in Build Back Better the is is another historic investment of 500, 550 billion dollars or so for that for for those provisions the clean energy tax credits I think are really important on from our perspective as well so but I'll I, you know again for for that very specific question I'll probably just circle back with you okay we do have another specific question from a solar provider um, Jason Sharp with Namaste. Um, very excited about Build Back Better. Applaud the unprecedented funded funding to support mitigating climate change. Um, and thanks you for your hard work. He um, just notes that 80% of jobs in the solar industry are from distributed energy projects that small businesses build. Um, and the provision for refundability of the solar ITC for 25D projects, which are the residential projects, is currently not scheduled to start until 2024. Um, could it, is it possible to bring this online sooner? <laughs> um, they're excited about encouraging domestic manufacturing of solar modules. Um, and it seems like maybe this, this um, having this excluded could be an oversight. Could it be included for 25D projects? 
So that's something that, you know, uh, feedback that, that I can take to our, um, uh, our energy staffer um, and, you know, communicate with the committee about, um, I know that um, the, the reality of, uh, you know, how a lot of these provisions are structured um, is unfortunately like constrained by the amount of um, funding that we have available um, in this bill um, to spend on them. And then some, in some cases, of course, it's a, a practical consideration of how long it takes to, to sort of ramp up um, the, the infrastructure or the, the changes uh, that, that IRS would need to make um, on tax provisions. But that is feedback that, uh, well, again, I am, I am not qualified to respond to it, that I can take back and, and you know, not only find out the, the answer to, but also to, to say uh, a little bit of a push that if we are able to, to move up the timeline, um, that that's something that, that our offices should be thinking about. Great. So, and just one more that we've got that's a little broader on um, clean energy. What are the programs that will open doors for small businesses to participate in the clean energy industry? It's an expensive industry to break into. Um, and because it's new, it also has a lot of risk involved. And you know, I would broaden this question in some degree to say what provisions of Build Back Better promote economic opportunity for entrepreneurs and small businesses? I, I think there's a couple, a couple areas that um, in, in the clean energy space, um, you know, the tax credits are there, there and, and I'll let Rachel talk a little bit more about those there's, if she wants about you know, $320 billion worth of tax credits um, for residential clean energy transmission, uh, you know, clean energy manufacturing, et cetera. Um, but I will say there's also $20 billion that we're thinking about in terms of um, providing incentives for the government to be the purchaser of, um, you know, of, of next generation technologies and clean construction materials, because it's not only a, you know, it's a public sector and a private sector uh, priority to, to to, to have climate change and clean energy to support clean energy. And I think yeah, as, as small businesses know that the 24, 25% of all federal contracts are supposed to go to small businesses. So if that 20 billion, um, you know, theoretically 20, 25% of that should be going to small businesses and within those subsets to minority owned businesses, to women owned businesses and to veteran owned businesses. Um, so we think there's an opportunity there for the, um, for the, for the federal government to create a market and then, and then to also to have to engage with um, small businesses in, 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 that, in that regard in the clean energy space. And I'll say, I mentioned, and John mentioned some of the other things that are happening in the small business space, like on the, um, you know, there's a billion dollars, which is the, 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 the expanding the growth accelerator, accelerator fund competition program in the SBA, which provides competitive grants to um, organizations providing various in a variety of industries. Um, a lot of those industries, a lot of those billion dollar grants or, or that billion dollars, a lot of those grants are, are specifically for new emerging industries, new emerging technologies, healthcare, energy, um, technology, et cetera. So I think there's a couple different, couple different places where we, where, um, you know, if and when it gets passed, we'll have some marketing to do and we'll need your reason, we'll need your help to do that. Okay, and one uh, final follow on for the climate um, issue, and, and this is a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's important for uh, your bosses to be aware of as they're, they're crafting the legislation that moves the solar industry forward. So um, apprenticeship and other kinds of qualifications for the type of worker who can do the work that is created through some of these in terms of job creation, they, small businesses have different types of accreditations than electricians, for example. Um, and they also have different challenges with accessing apprenticeship um, programs. So it's really important and moving forward with, uh, with the stuff to make sure that, that the requirements that are, that are couched around these um, efforts ensure that small businesses can compete um, with larger businesses for, uh, for projects, um, particularly, and of course, the ones that are, that are appropriate to their size of business, but also not assuming that a small business can't handle a large building. So I'm just gonna pass that along. Um, and then uh, we'll just move quickly to some equity questions. 
uh, in terms of, um, well, here's a great question. I wonder if all these proposals will be available for undocumented community members, members of our community uh, who do not have documents. Yeah, so I think I think the answer is it varies heavily. Uh, I mean, a lot of the um, I, Naveen and, and John should speak to this, but I think uh, a lot of times the the business provisions, um, you know, that that we expect to to also benefit workers um, are less tied um, uh, in in many cases to to a, like a citizenship requirement. But on the uh, you know, so a lot of the stuff on the the finance committee side on the the social safety net, for example, we have thus far been been unsuccessful. Um, in you know stripping away some of the the requirements for say a social security number to receive the child tax credit that's something that my boss has been pushing for for years. Um, the uh, 2017 Republican tax bill you know implemented a social security requirement where there was none before and so in that and in many other instances you know we are are. Um, uh, have a, a months and in some cases years long effort to to uh, remove requirements where they they exist because we think that um, it does not make sense um, to for our economy for families for businesses uh, you know for for um, important uh, supports that um, benefit us all as communities to be to be tied um, to. Uh, a social security number. Uh, nonetheless, um, that is a, t uh, a tough and uphill battle in, um, in the Senate in some cases. And so where the House has done good work, for example, on the, on the child tax credit by taking away that, that social security number requirement so that families uh, with, uh, you know, who are immigrants or who have children um, who don't have a social security number would be able to receive it. We're having to push very hard um, to maintain uh, that that equity uh, when it when it comes to the Senate and and again it's it can be an uphill battle. Um, so I wish I had had sort of better news um, on that front. Um, but uh, rest assured that you know that's something that that my boss and I think Senator Hickerhofer are very committed to. I recall that Senator Bennett was on the Gang of Eight that came up with some with a proposal for um, fair and humane immigration reform several years ago, and unfortunately it did not succeed, but I know that that Senator Bennett um, has historically made that a, an important issue and we just want to remind him it's still important to us. So um, lastly- yeah, there's, one, there's, one, there's just one thing I can add on, on sort of the, you know, uh, Rachel alluded to it that, you know, for a lot of the business provisions, um, you know, you don't have to be, uh, have a social security number to take, to, you know, to to take a tax credit or a tax deduction for your for your business that's here, um, so those tax benefits, if, if, as they sort of roll through, um, should should be available to um, you know the, the, the small business owner. Um, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you can still apply for an SBA loan for your small business. Um, that in general, as as long as you have legal permanent resident status, you know, green as a green card holder, you can qualify for SBA financing. Um, you know, if you, if you're not, uh, if you don't have LPR status, things are a little more complicated. Um, but you do not have to have a, you know, a social security number or, or be a U.S. citizen for, for to access some, uh, a, a variety of the SBA programs. Um, I'm going to run, run over just a little bit and make sure that my thank yous are really quick. So in just one or one minute or two, um, how will dollars be invested in new small businesses? Is there a focus on better supporting women and BIPOC businesses? Um, and a similar question, is there, are there provisions to build capacity of minority-owned business? How is it structured and accessed? And what conversations are happening around how partners, like the ones that are our partners for this call, um, get, uh, get people here to get people here can collectively access or individually as an organization. So I can I can take a stab at the at the first piece. Um, I think yes, uh, those you know getting getting women and minority owned businesses and BIPOC businesses involved in our and or more involved in the economy is um, something some the senators Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Bennett you know are are 
really support. Um, I'll go back to our bill. I'll go, I'll go back to our micro SBIC bill, which, um, you know, is this, is that public private partnership that has, um, venture investment managers making, uh, funding available to access, making to, to small businesses. And, and again, when they, when, when those fund managers look, um, more like that look like America and look, look diverse, then they tend to make, tend to make investments in, um, the broad section and cross section of America. So we think that's, that's one, one area. The one area, um, that's also being considered in the small business space is, um, is a, is what we're calling an uplift, um, it's a, a new program. We should have, we should have mentioned it earlier, which is, um, an uplift accelerator program. And it's, um, establishing a network of government contracting incubators at, um, historically black colleges and minority serving institutions. So basically it would be, you know, the SBA and the federal government will be going into these HBCUs, talking with them, um, talking to those entrepreneurs and, and making sure that there's a network of their, their, those, businesses that are connected to those colleges have access to um, federal contracts and have access to, um, you know, incubator programs, grant programs, SBA lending programs to uplift those, to uplift those BIPOC communities as well. Thank you so much for that. Go ahead, John. I'd also say too, I mean, so we have about at, at present $1.6 billion. Um, and this is, you know, it goes along with what Nami was just mentioning. That's more than a quarter of the five billion total is dedicated to the minority business development agency, which would help, you know, these sorts of people. And I think also if you look, I mean, you know, it's our jobs, right, to look at the legislation, but um, you know, a lot of it is it's it's almost entirely throughout the bill is dedicated towards helping um, you know, women-owned businesses. And even if it's not explicit and the um the statute itself, like the enhanced use of defense production might not have that. Um you know, it's not in the title of it, you know, and the hundred billion dollars going to that, but um, it is still mentioned throughout. Um, and so I think it is a really, you know, it's definitely a priority for um, the small business development, you know, our small business um, committee and uh, and definitely our boss in particular, given, you know, his stance and, and the bills he's put forward. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. So uh, we're going to have to wrap, but I wish we had another half hour or, or so with you. We will forward you all of the comments and questions, um, and hopefully we can get some answers to that. Um, just want to reiterate how important some of the things we've talked about are to us today as you carry it back and um, the senator ne negotiates with other senators on what stays in and how they can get a, a, a bill across the finish line with all the things in it that it needs. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, John. Thanks to the senators, uh, Bennett and Hickenlooper for their openness to us. Um, um, thanks to all of the folks who tuned in today. Um, we just had a lot of great questions and thoughtful comments. I want to thank everyone who participated today. Um, it's been really good. This is how it works. This is, this is how we make the sausage work for us. <laughs> So um, yeah, and, and finally, a huge thank you to all our sponsors. I'm gonna ask Jordan to run them down once again, not our sponsors, sorry, our partners, all our wonderful partners that we work with. Jordan, who are they? <laughs> sure, yeah, thanks again to everyone for, uh, for joining today and uh, for the Senator's staff for, for, um, <clears throat> for joining the call to answer these questions. And yeah, so our incredible list of partners again is uh, Adelante Community Development, the Alliance Center, uh, Black Business Initiative, Business for America, Colorado Black Chamber of Commerce, Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce, um, E2, the uh, Latino Chamber of Commerce of Boulder County, Local First in Durango, Metro Deep Partnership for Community Action, Rocky Mountain Microfinance Institute, Small Business Majority, and Work-Life Partnership. So uh, yeah, thank you for all of the, uh, the incredible work helping to get folks here. And uh, Angelique, it looks like you've got something to close us out. Yes, one more huge, huge thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for providing the language equity for us today. It's so important, and we really appreciate your participation here. And for anybody who had questions that didn't get answered, um, we are going to go ahead and share those questions uh, with the Senator's staff. Um, we'll also share along contact information so uh, those folks can get answers directly to you. So um, thanks for that. Bye, everyone. All right. Take care.